Bienvenidos, welcome to this hearing, uh, to this briefing on the Democracy Restoration Act hosted by Senator Cardin. Um, I'm Mirna Perez, and I am director of the Voting Rights and Elections Project at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. And I want to thank you for being here with us. We are going to have an information-packed hour for you. And we have experts that have come from both near and far to share with you their unique perspective on why it is that the Democracy Restoration Act is important. But before we begin with the panelists, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Senator Cardin. It is his vision and tenacity and leadership that allows us to be with us, uh, to be here today. Uh, he has been serving the people of Maryland for over 40 years. Uh, he has been a strong supporter of the DRA for more than 10. Um, indeed, he has sponsored it in the last four congressional sessions and introduced it today. So without further ado, Senator Cardin. Well, first, let me thank all the panelists that are here for this briefing and for your extraordinary leadership on this, this subject. Uh, we have been dealing with democracy restoration for a long time because uh, the evolution of modern day Jim Crow laws, we've seen it take different turns over the last several decades. And the ugly face has emerged as a, a campaign strategy to try to control elections, uh, which have no place in America. And we all know that. And we're determined to make sure that we rid ourselves of any efforts to disenfranchise uh, the voters of this country. Uh, I say this is modern Jim Crow. We all know that. We know how this affects the minority community, the African-American community, over 6 million are today disenfranchised as a result of losing their voting rights because of a com conviction, uh, one out of every 13 African Americans. So it is a, d a deliberate effort by certain states to control eligible voters in a way that favors uh, what they believe their political outcome. Uh, that can have no place in America. And that's why we are strongly supporting legislation uh, that would do what I believe now 16 states have done uh, in passing a restoration of voting for their uh, individuals who have come out of the prison system. I must tell you that some have been stronger than others. There are some states that have passed uh, voter restoration uh, but have made certain exceptions for certain crimes or have limited to after you finish your parole. Uh, th there is no justification at all for denying a person the right to vote after they have paid their, their, uh, their, their due to our society through our criminal justice system. And let us not forget that our criminal justice system is already skewed in a discriminatory fashion. We took the first step to do something about it in the last Congress. Uh, it was an incredible effort under extremely challenging circumstances. And we were able at long last to take uh, a step in the right direction dealing with the discriminatory sentencing that we have here in America. It's well past time to take another step, a second step, on the road towards doing what is right and fair in our society. I applaud my colleagues in the House. I'm particularly proud that um, my member of the House of Representatives, John Sarbanes, uh, who represents me very well, uh, it was the lead author of HB1 that includes a, a lot of good governance and human rights and, and good uh, and, and integrity issues, uh, including uh, voter restoration uh, and dealing with democracy restoration issues. So we have made some progress. Uh, this is the year that we hope we can make more progress. We've had some bipartisan interest in doing in this area. We've had certainly uh, several members who have been pretty outspoken about this. Uh, the bottom line is that there is no justification for permanently denying an individual uh, the right to participate in our system after they have served their sentence. 
Uh, these studies have all shown that recidivism d dramatically declines when an individual is invited back into our society after they come out of prison. So there is no justification that we shouldn't be able to move forward in this area. And we have the experts here today, and we look forward to their presentations. I can tell you the information that's going to be made available to, today, uh, it will be, uh, we will use that uh, in our campaign to get Congress to act. Uh, we are trying and reaching out to all sources, including uh, 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 trying to get uh, some people in the White House interested in this, uh, certainly people on the other side of the aisle, on the Republican side of the aisle, and I'm certain that today's briefings will help us in achieving uh, that objective. Thank you all. Appreciate it. I'd also like to introduce Representative Jerry Hertaus from Minnesota. He is a leader in the Minnesota legislature on criminal justice reform, specifically on the issue of reducing the amount of collateral consequences that are affiliated with disenfranchisement. He has been a sponsor of Minnesota legislation that would do what the DRA would do, which would make it such that people who are living and working in our community are able to vote, um, notwithstanding a criminal conviction in their past. And as a Republican, he has been given a great deal of uh, praise and laud uh, for being able to bring people of all kinds together. He has been joined by Republicans and Democrats in his work, and he is an inspiring source of bipartisan collaboration on this issue. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. I want to thank... Uh, Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending. I want to thank uh, Senator Cardin for inviting me and uh, Ms. Perez for also inviting me. And I uh, especially want to thank Senator Cardin for the initiation of, of this act and uh, what it will do uh, with regard to creating a more uniform election uh, system throughout the nation. To understand a little bit uh, why I'm uh, committed to this uh, effort, is to maybe tell you a little bit about Minnesota. In Minnesota, as likely is the case in many other states, forfeiture of your uh, civil rights to vote is a consequence of um, being convicted and prosecuted uh, with regards to felony statutes. And in Minnesota in 1858, when the state became a state, in its state constitution, it actually has a prohibition for anybody co uh, convicted of treason or of a felony from uh, being able to vote. But what's important in our state constitution, it also has unless restrictions to civil rights have been restored. So in 1858, there were approximately 68 to 70 felony statutes uh, on the books uh, with regard to uh, statehood. Uh, today, uh, we, I think in many respects, we've over-criminalized behavior in America that we now have in Minnesota more than 500 felony statutes. Uh, you can see uh, quite a contrast from our founding era to where we are today with regard to our attitudes about uh, crime and the punishment for crime. Ironically, though, in Minnesota, 80% of those who are incarcerated are there because of alcohol or drug-related offenses, generally considered not to be violent offenders. Worse in Minnesota, there's strong evidence that where you commit this crime may greatly affect the degree of punishment imposed upon conviction. Uh, rural Minnesotans are much more likely to re, uh, receive a severe uh, punishment or consequence as opposed to uh, urban uh, <coughs> offenders who oftentimes uh, the urban areas is more overwhelmed as far as the criminal justice system and oftentimes stays of adjudication or plea deals are often entered into. Now, I'd like to remind everybody that probation and parole are really a more contemporary alternative to uh, incarceration. And this basically uh, began in the beginning of the 20th century in the early 1900s. Minnesota ranks among the 50 states 47th for the rate of incarceration. In Minnesota, we tend to not lock you up. But on the other hand, we are sixth highest in the nation with regard to those who are under adult correctional supervision. What that means in Minnesota at that rate is one in 24 Minnesota adults 
are under direct correctional supervision and under our current system and our law are denied the ability to vote. And that relates to about 4% of adults in Minnesota. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is true in Minnesota. I'm sure it's true across many other states in the nation. And this has, in my best judgment, created nothing less than a patchwork amongst the many states uh, with regard to uh, restorative rights and uh, voting upon conviction. I believe that this uh, DRA would mend this patchwork to be one fabric and to uh, provide equal protection to Americans all across our land under the law. So if a citizen anywhere in this United States is deemed to be not inimical to public safety and is permitted to assimilate in the general population, it only follows in my mind that disenfranchisement from voting should end when released from incarceration. The costs of operating the criminal justice system and the administrative burdens are very high. In Minnesota, it costs about $35,000 a year to keep a person incarcerated. So reform must be most influenced by those whom have been part of this system or have been touched by the arm of government. And if these same voices of the people cannot vote, reform most certainly is greatly diminished. So the DRA is an important step forward to ensuring equal protection of voting rights in federal elections. And I think that passage of such a law would provide an incentive for the state legislatures to follow suit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Representative. <clears throat> So I just remind the audience that we have everybody's bios in a program. That way um, we can kind of make the conversation go a little bit faster. Um, so, Nicole, um, you are the executive director of Out for Justice in Maryland, and uh, we're part of the campaign in Maryland to change Maryland's law so that people with past criminal convictions who are in the community could vote. Um, and uh, you, uh, as a result of that law, you were able to get your own rights restored, right, and vote uh, for the first time in a long time in yes. 2018, is that right? Yes. yes. That's an applause line for the <laughs> So can you tell the audience why the DRA is important um, to you and to the communities that you represent? Sure. Um, so first, I want to thank you for having Out for Justice as a voice here at the table and um, to Senator Carton for uh, leading and championing this issue on, on the federal level. Um, and just really quickly, Out for Justice is a small grassroots organization based in Maryland that is led by the formerly incarcerated, and we pay close attention to the legislative process. So we follow the same schedule of lawmakers. When they are in session, we're in session. When they go back to the district, we go back to the district. Um, why this is in, in 2015, it was important for Maryland to restore voting rights for not only individuals coming home from prison or jail, but those who are still under probation and parole supervision. And many of us believe that um, you cannot ask us to pay taxes. You cannot ask us to go to work every day and contribute to our households and our families without giving us the ability to make sure we uh, um, get to have a say in who represents us, right, on a local and state and federal level. Um, and in particular, too, for many of us, in particular black women, um, knowing the history of, of the challenges that black people faced here in America with voting rights, it had always been a tradition um, to vote, right? That is important for us. Um, and so for me, I would make it a traditional thing that I took my my children to the polls with me and I took my nieces and nephews to the polls with me. And so... When that right was taken away, right? You know, I understand. I, you know, I did my time. I, I, I did a, I did a crime. I did my time for it. Now I'm back to business, right? Now I'm back to restoring my life, helping to restore my community, and to deny me access to be able to have a say in what happens in my city and in my state. Um, it's contradictory to what folks tell us when we get out. They tell us, go back to school, go get your education, you know, go do the right thing. But, oh, no, you can't have a say in what happens in government. Like, you can't decide which elected officials represent you. You can't control 
what happens um, even on a local level with my streets and, you know, all of these things that folks um, need to be a part of. Um, and you have to make sure people feel invested in their communities and in their state. Um, you can't tell people to go uh Go take an investment that doesn't belong to me. If you're an investor, you are going to buy into that investment. You're going to take care of it. You're going to nurture it. And so we're thinking about America and our voting rights like an investment. You can't ask us to have an investment in something that we can't buy into, that we can't benefit from. Um, so Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Jim, you are uh, the founder of 70 by 70, a re-entry organization. You are the former CEO of Prison Fellowship. Um, you are on the board of Crossroads Prison Ministry, and uh, you have your own parish. And as such, you are intimately connected to folks who are still within the prison walls, people who are trying to bring their life back um, and get their life back together once they leave, and the communities they enter. And I was hoping from those perspectives you'd be able to share for us why you think the DRA is important. Thank you for your hard work on this. And Senator Cardin, thank you for you. Senator Cardin's staff, thank you for your hard work. Um, to me, Myrna, this is an issue of human dignity. Um, my nephew also served time in Texas, and I have four law enforcement officers in my family. And uh, so I look at this from a broad spectrum. It's particularly uh, interesting that we're having um, this hearing at this time of the year for the Christian tradition. Uh, there's a picture of Jesus on the cross between two convicted offenders. And the one convicted offender says, remember me when you enter paradise. But Jesus answered him differently than his question. He said, no, you will be with me when I enter paradise. So he gives him more than he asks for. And significantly also in that part of our tradition, Jesus does not condemn the thief on the left. He doesn't condemn him. He, I think, maybe waited patiently for him because he too is a person of dignity. We call it the imago dei or the image of God in every person. Uh, the, the authors of the Declaration of Independence in our country said that it is an, an alienable right given to us by our creator. We don't give rights to people. We steward the rights that we have in our democracy. Um, so to take a right away goes against what I consider to be a foundational element of what I believe deeply in my heart. How do we restore people? Um, I believe our criminal justice system right now is asking the wrong question. We're asking how do we get, quote, unquote, bad people out of our neighborhood? That affects how we police. That affects how we see people in our neighborhoods. It affects our uh, implicit bias. I believe the right question is how do we bring good people home? Because what we want to do is restore. The Quakers began our penitentiary system in the United States, and uh, it, it was named penance, and that's where we get the name penitentiary. And you did two things when you went to do penance. Number one, you learned a new way of life, and so you engaged with a different group of people than you engaged with when you were committing your crime. And then you learned. You learned how to have a trade. You learned how to give back to the community. And the whole goal of the penitentiary system was not punishment or punitive. It was restorative. So we look at the issue of voting rights, and uh, I, I was privileged to spend a lot of time in prison cells with individuals, speaking to them, privileged to hear their stories, to, to hear what made them them. And the, the times that I would hear men and women talk about just following what was happening in their neighborhoods, I realized we have the cyclical element of crime in, in particularly the urban cores of our cities. Once we take away a voting right, we now have created another cycle. Mm -hmm. Parents aren't taking their kids to the polls. Parents aren't taking them to places where we're learning about the, about the public policy understanding of the individuals who are running for office. We will create, if we continue this, and maybe we already have a cycle, not only of disenfranchisement of those who've committed crimes, but we will create a generational cycle of disenfranchisement that will render us less than a country we are today. Mm -hmm. By that restoration, based on human dignity, based on the rights given by God, not by man, if we steward those well and give voting rights back, we can reverse those cycles. And I believe look like the way our founders wanted us to look. Thank you, thank you. 
So, Veronica, you are the head of the leading professional association of community corrections officers, the American Probation and Paroling Authorities. Um, I have been very privileged to be working with APPA for the better part of a decade. And I think um, APPA and its uh, consistent and strong support for voting rights for people when they got uh, when they are released um, offers a really unique perspective. Can you talk to me about why um, rights restoration is so important to the work that the APAPA does and your members? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I also want to echo what my colleagues said. Thanks to the senator and the staff. Uh, Brennan Center, you guys are absolutely amazing. Championing something like this is just... Uh, a lot of people would think the uh, probation and parole officers would be on the other side of this, mm -hmm. but that's quite the contrary. Um, if there is any group of people who connect with folks with criminal records, it's probation and parole officers because you see them every day, you talk to them every day, you're in their homes, in their personal space. So we really get it. So our organization, which is the Professional Membership Association for People um, in the field of probation and parole or community corrections, as we refer to it, and it's not just probation and parole, but it's also pretrial. We also have members who are researchers and from the academia side of it, um, individuals who are advocates for uh, legislation, things like this. Um, we also have a lot of students who are interested in criminal justice um, that are members of our, or, of our organization. We're about 35,000 strong, although there are about 100,000 probation and parole officers across the country. Um, but we speak with one voice. So even if they're not a member, we often seek information from our non-members to find out what platforms, what issues we should address on their behalf. And our work is not just for the probation officer, but it's also for the person with the criminal record. So when people come to us as practitioners, uh, our job really, the net net of what we do is public safety. Right? So that's probably why it's a little confusing to some people that says you're supposed to make sure these people don't commit new crimes. Well, the way you do that is you don't further disenfranchise them. You provide opportunities for them to grow and to be different people than the people they were when they first got arrested. So we're constantly working with them, with treatment providers, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can direct them in the right way. Voting, and it's interesting when I heard your story, Nicole, about taking your children to the polls, I recall as a probation officer having a guy on my caseload, and I was a, I'm like 500 years old, so it's a long time since I was a probation officer, but I had a guy on my caseload who actually had recently been married, and so he had a stepdaughter. She was about 10 years old, and he and his wife took the stepdaughter to the voting poll, and he shared the story with me. He said when they got there, of course, he couldn't vote, but his wife could. And the little girl asked, well, Daddy, why aren't you voting? And he was too embarrassed to tell her why, because she didn't know his background. She didn't know he had spent time in prison. And so to me, that's just like that bothered me, because what we're doing is we're setting, that's this new generation of people who are saying, well, voting is not important. My dad didn't vote, so why should I? It's just a terrible, terrible um, place to, to be and, and, and a space to set for children. There's so much uh, that our organization is trying to do uh, in this space as well as in a lot of other spaces with respect to employment with people with criminal records. I just have this thing I've always felt as a probation officer, when you are sentenced to that particular, whatever your sentence is for your offense, why should you carry a scarlet letter on your head permanently? It's just not right. And I think a couple of other people said that you have actually um, given yourself an opportunity, or well, actually, no, you have stymied yourself. If you can't vote, if you can't get a job, and the list goes on. One of the things we do as probation and parole officers is we really encourage these individuals to get their lives on track. And like you said, Nicole, if everything you do, people are saying, but yes, but you can't vote. You can pay taxes, and ironically enough, guess what? When you pay taxes as a person with a criminal record, you're paying taxes for a person who ultimately is going to be a public servant. Yep. So you're paying that person's salary, but you can't vote for that person. That just doesn't make sense to me. So there's a lot to be said about the work that needs to be done. Uh, this legislation is so impactful, not just for the individual, not just for the probation or parole officer, but for that individual's community, 
and then society as a whole. So APPA completely supports and I think should be passed like yesterday. Um, so Edgardo, you are the former guy in charge for Virginia elections. You were in charge for four years and during that period, the governor um, used his executive authority to change the uh, Virginia's policy such that more people can be brought in. I'm wondering if you can talk about this confusing patchwork of laws that we have across the country and how that makes it hard to administer elections. Uh, thank you, uh, Mirna, and uh, thank you for the senator for inviting me today. Um, I think the, you know, from the election administration perspective, uh, and, and so I previously worked at the local level in elections too, um, and you know, a lot of people uh, today already have kind of laid out, and I think the DRA kind of in the beginning of the act lays out the, uh, the different issues with state-based policies, uh, but to kind of sum it up in an easy way, it's a mess, uh, <laughs> right, in terms of how those uh, policies work for election administrators, in terms of figuring out uh, who is eligible to vote um, and what they have to do in, in order to prove uh, or show the eligibility. All right. For for election administrators, I think the um, their role should be to facilitate uh, the voting process for uh, eligible individuals. Right. But they also uh, have to be mindful of not allowing people that aren't eligible to participate in the process. Right. So it's a very fine line that they're walking um, and having these very complex uh, rules in place, uh, not just about uh, when the when restoration happens, uh, but it being different for certain crimes, right? And so trying to figure out what categories of crimes uh, fit into certain time frames, uh, figuring out uh, whether or not people have uh, paid all sorts of court costs that uh, may be out there is poorly tracked. Um, and so just from an administrative standpoint, uh, one of the difficulties uh, in, in figuring that out uh, is, you know, uh, that patchwork of stuff. And so Governor McAuliffe, um, I was there, had the, uh, you know, went through, and Virginia is one of the now three remaining states where uh, the state constitution requires the governor uh, to restore voting rights uh, before someone's eligible to vote in the state. Uh, and so uh, Governor McAuliffe uh, went ahead and said, well, everybody is going to get their rights restored. Uh, and so, you know, he restored rights to over 173,000 uh, individuals during his time in office. Uh, and one of the things we found in, in kind of preparing for that, uh, again, when you look at uh, things like fines and fees, uh, there's no centralized place to keep track of that. Uh, local courts have very poor records about, you know, whether or not people have paid. Uh, it's difficult to get that sort of information. Um, when it comes to types of crimes, uh, he did it without regard to what the type of crime was, uh, simply that the person was no longer uh, under supervision uh, because it was something that was easy to figure out, right, or easier. Uh, when you talk about the DRA, right, it's very easy to determine for an election administrator, uh, for a public servant, is someone currently incarcerated or not, uh, right? There's a, very, there's a very clear line. It's something that some government entity is going to be able to tell you pretty clearly, is this person uh, currently incarcerated or not? Uh, and so it makes it very easy from an administration standpoint uh, to do that. Uh, Virginia, we, uh, you know, when working at the local level, uh, we used to have to figure out uh, if people were convicted in states other than Virginia, uh, what are the rules in that other state? Uh, does it happen automatically uh, in Virginia? You get a, a writ from the governor restoring your rights. What about an automatic restoration state where there is no paperwork? Uh, what do you do then? Uh, so all these questions, I think, uh, really make it difficult uh, to, for uh, election administrators to do their job, which is to get people registered uh, and to administer elections. Uh, and so the DRA would kind of set those ground rules across the board, uh, make it a lot easier to uh, to administer that process and to get people onto the roll so that election administrators can really focus on doing their, uh, their job, which is to run the elections. Thank you. That is a, a great point that I'd like um, for the other panelists to weigh in. So the Democracy Restoration Act sets a very bright line. If you are in the community, you are able to vote. 
assuming, of course, that you're a citizen. Um, there are other states that have policies that make distinctions between probation and parole or carve out certain crimes or put uh, restrictions on whether or not you have to pay certain financial obligations. And I was hoping that the rest of the panelists could weigh in on why they thought that a clear rule made sense. A bright line, if you're in the community, um, you're able to get your right to vote back. Do you mind if we start with you, Steve? Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. And uh, in Minnesota, we, re we rely heavily on uh, volunteers as election judges in both local and statewide elections. And I think uh, the bright line, as we've uh, tended to refer this to, makes it very easy to not wonder if somebody is standing in, uh, in the election polling line, whether or not they're a convicted felon or not. How, how are you supposed to know? People don't really want to be confrontational at a time of voting, and I think this just makes it very simple. If, if you're not locked up, if you're standing in line, you're eligible to vote. It should be just that simple. It uh, really eliminates a great deal of confusion and is a uh, great step forward in terms of restorative rights. N Nicole, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> um, so I echo this whole, when I heard you talking about the election process, it just made my hair raise because in Maryland, we dealt with a lot of those issues, right? So for one, with groups like Alpha Justice had to do with no funding, right? And we have a group called um, League of Women Voters, and they go in and they make sure folks are registered. And um, But what we had in Maryland, that even when our voting rights was restored, we had very confusing forms. The forms misled people and made them feel like they... They didn't know. And so to avoid any conflict, they wouldn't go to the polls. Um, so those are the confusing forms. Um, then we had to make sure that we were educating parole officers, right? Because even though the law had changed, we had to do a great deal of education and education and education. So we had to do that. Um, and then I will be so boldly as to say that all it, it should not matter what your crime was. For me, if it had nothing to do with election tampering or anything dealing with elections, like, you should be able to vote. The crime that I went in for had nothing to do with voting. And so why am I penalized um, for voting? Um, and then lastly, this whole, uh, this whole criminalization of poverty, right, the idea that a fine or a fee will be attached to my me having the ability to vote. It's frustrating, right? Because we have people across America who their poverty is criminalized every day for driving offenses and and court fees. That has nothing to do with the fact that if you are running to be my senator, I have the right to decide if I want you to be my senator. That has nothing to do with fines and fees and owing, owing on my car that I really couldn't afford to pay the insurance on. Um, and so uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe that this, this bill would streamline everything for us in this country. It would get rid of any of the confusion. It would make things clear and simple. And we would not have to worry about voter suppression, where you have to decide, is this the right voter? Are they off of probation and parole? When your feet touches the soil, your voting rights should be restored, period. Reverend Liskey, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I think the, the clear, bright line is very important on, on both, if, if you would, both sides of this issue. Number one, for the person returning home, the sooner I can move away from the stigma mm -hmm. and, and the most easily I can move away from the stigma, the better chance I'm staying home and not going back to prison. So when there's just a clear guideline that this is the issue, and, and we talked earlier, um, I would even go as far to say, as particularly in the Federal Bureau, your paperwork when you go home should have your voter card in it. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also uh, a very important issue here for our volunteers who man the polls. Um, one of the great things about the American system of voting is that it is driven predominantly by volunteers. We don't pay people to do this. We move away from things that could be corrupted. It's When you vote, you're voting with people in your community and it's run by people in your community. 
when you have this confusing process of if, what, this form, that form, they will, by necessity, keep people from voting mm -hmm. in order to protect the process. A clear line that says, if you're here and you're not behind the walls, you're eligible to vote would be very important. And then what about your probation officers and your experience there? How does yeah. how does these how do these distinctions among folks that are out there disrupt reentry? Yeah, I support everything that's been said. You know, being on probation and parole is a job in itself. It's very challenging. Um, you know, again, individuals are are there for a reason because they were uh, convicted of a crime. So you know, they have to say you do the crime, you do the time. So we get that. Um, but there are so many requirements. And if you add some other kind of something they don't understand how to navigate through, you've got a problem. And as I've said before, it's not always, well, it's not ever just about that individual on probation and parole. It's about his family. So if he's married, his wife is, is involved, or if, it, you know, if, it's a, if it's a woman, her husband is involved with helping her to navigate through all of the rules and conditions of probation and parole, and now you got to figure out, okay, are you eligible to vote? Are you in this pool or not? Clean across the board. I've, I've, I've been sentenced by this judge for X amount of years. I've completed that period of time. I deserve to have my right restored to vote, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. So I think the last question um, I'm going to ask of all of the panelists before we open it up to the audience for questions is why should the Congress pass the DRA now? Mm. Go ahead, Edgarda. Uh, so I think in terms of passing it now, um, uh, you know, again, from an election administrator, administration perspective, uh, there's been kind of a lot of focus, right, on uh, keeping clean voter rolls and making sure that uh, only eligible people are able to vote. I think something like the DRA is going to really help facilitate that process and make it a very clear cut uh, process for uh, people that are uh, that have done their time and completed their sentences are you know are now uh, back out in the community, but also for uh, election officials and really uh, prevent um, you know people from getting inappropriately denied uh, access to the process. Uh, and so I think um, delaying that d just doesn't make sense. So uh, I think that's why the time for this is right now because uh, we shouldn't keep with this patchwork of stuff that we have out in the states. Okay, Veronica. Yeah, you know, the, the timing is now. Uh, things have changed. I was reflecting uh, today, I was talking to one of my colleagues back at the office. So in 2008, the Second Chance Act was passed, bipartisan. In 2018, the First Step Act was passed. Mm -hmm. This is April. This is Second Chance Act month. Right. I can't think of a better time than now. Mm. It's the right time and it's the right thing to do. I, I would agree with Veronica and with Senator Cardin that there's some momentum, and I think we need to keep this ball rolling. The quicker we reduce the collateral consequences mm -hmm. of committing a crime, that's, that's the second prison, so you mm -hmm. come home and you have these collateral consequences, the quicker we reduce them, the more we in, increase the safety of our communities and the dignity of human beings. This is a major collateral consequence. I think this push could have a lot following it. And Representative Hurkowitz. Well, thank you for that question. And I think the DRA is probably the most important part that can assure uh, our constitutional rights under the 14th Amendment, and that is equal protection. Imagine, if you would, that you commit the same crime in Maine or Illinois or Iowa or Minnesota or rural Minnesota. Uh, you're treated differently based on where that happens. And the federal government has purview and broad discretion with regard to the elections clause in the administration of federal elections. So I think the time is right for that. Uh, as I mentioned, some of these states, if it was Illinois or Iowa, you never get to vote, ever, again. Uh, if you happen to commit that crime in Maine or Vermont, uh, you still get to vote. And as I mentioned earlier in Minnesota, if it's a, a rural crime versus an urban crime of the same nature, if you have the funds, the money, and the resources, you can seek an expungement. You can get a gubernatorial expungement. You can uh, plea deal, uh, maybe get your charge reduced from a felony to a gross misdemeanor. And in those events, uh, then you get to vote. 
And so for those who don't have the money or the resources, I think our Constitution is clear. Equal protection means not for some, but for all of us. And I think this is the right time to initiate the DRA. And then Nicole. Um, so... Yes, ma'am. You hear me now? Um, for one, this is not only the right time. We are actually behind. <laughs> We're way behind here. Um, and so, like my colleague to the right of me talked about, uh, this is important now so that we can begin to move away from the stigma associated with having a criminal record. As a black woman, I know how um, this stigma it, it just carries with you all over the place. And taking it and not being able to vote is just another extinction of having a stigma associated. Reducing a collateral consequence, like my colleague said, voting should not be a collateral consequence. We have thousands and thousands of collateral consequences in the state of Maryland, and this could be one that we could reduce. And giving individuals a level playing field. I mean, already when you talk about... Um, the laws, the old uh, antiquated laws and policies that we have on the books now, individuals with criminal records, we are entrenched with 50, 60 years of bad laws and policies imposed on us. And and like you said, Representative, the, um, the, the criminalizing of behaviors is more apparent than, in, than any time, right? And so uh, reducing collateral consequences um, and... Also, removing the criminalization of poverty, because in some states, fines and fees are associated with your right to vote. Let's remove that criminalization of poverty. Um, and then lastly, um, I was born an American, and I should be treated as such. And born as an American, it is your right to be able to decide who represents you. And then lastly, let me tell you what having the right to vote is associated with. It's also associated with getting money for education. And in your state, as a registered voter, you get access to delegates and senatorial scholarships. The first thing your delegate or senator asks you in your local state is, what, are you a registered voter? That's the one thing you need <laughs> to be able to get access to a senatorial scholarship. So me not having a right to vote, you, you tell me to get out and go back to school, oh, but I'm prohibited because I don't have the right to vote. So I can't even go and apply for a delegate or a senatorial scholarship. We're behind the ball. We need to make sure individuals with criminal records are included, not just try to make us feel included. We should be included because we are not only a voting a base, but we're also a tax base, and our children will then become a tax base. And so if you want our children to invest in this in America, then you need to make sure that we have a seat at the investment table. Thank you all. Um, we are now opening it up to questions. I hope folks will have some. Go ahead. Uh, the question is, what is being done on a level um, to educate? Because, uh, again, as Nicole has stated, it's so hard for us, and including myself as a formerly incarcerated black woman in Maryland, to even understand and uh, whether or not we can vote and having confusing forms at the MVA and then uh, having everybody just tell me, well, I don't know, I don't know. I'm going to opt not to vote if I'm not I'm um, educated on the process, but what about the parole and probation officers? What about them being educated on the process? Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that you asked that question. 
You're right. They need to be educated on the process. And one of the things we do at the American Probation and Parole Association, we try to ensure that our members have information to help them understand uh, not just what they should do in terms of evidence-based practices and supervising individuals, but understand those challenges outside of the probation and parole office. Uh, we always encourage and welcome organizations like yours to send us material, and we'll send it out, or we'll put it on our website. Um, there are jurisdictions, millions of them across the country, large and small, and not all of them are going to be astute and have all of the information they need to make uh, good decisions or to share good information with their clients. So provide that information to your local uh, probation and parole department. I encourage you highly. Okay, great. Thank you. I saw a question in the back over here. Somebody? Please. Um, so we've seen, um, we've seen reenfranchisement, you know, from in states with both Democratic and Republican governors. So I'm just curious what you see as the barriers to, to getting the DRA passed. Bill, do you want to take that question, or would you like me to? <laughs> um, one of it, well, I want to say that I think that while there, while there are barriers, I think um, they're overcomable. I think we are in a particular moment right now. We are in a moment where Americans are demanding free, fair, and accessible elections. We are in a moment where um, folks on both sides of the aisle can see that our criminal justice system is broken. And we are in a moment where people's desire for progress and growth is palpable. We had um, movement in states like Louisiana and New York and Florida. We see exciting prospects for movements in states that are very, very different, like Iowa, Tennessee, and New Jersey. Um, I think one of the challenges is going to be uh, making sure that everyone on um, everyone in Congress is educated about it, making sure that they're hearing from experts like this panel who uh, represents a bipartisan view from a bunch of different uh, fields where their professional expertise uh, is a view that this makes America stronger. This makes America better. This is a more successful way of bringing people into our community so that they will have a successful reentry. Um, I'm really hopeful because every time I've had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this, people people get it. I think what becomes harder is making the space, um, given all that's going on in the country and a lot of the noise that we're all dealing with, is actually being able to sit down and talk to people. But I think we have to start doing that. This is going to be a, you know, this is going to be a slog. But I think one by one we can move people. We just have to take the time to do it. Please. Thank you all for being here and giving us this opportunity to have this conversation. I'm Gary Decker. I'm the director of issue campaigns at the Alliance for Youth Organizing. Uh, and I have a litany of questions, but I'll just, I'll just ask one. Uh, how have you all found success in taking this conversation out of, although it's a political decision, taking it out of the political realm uh, and getting people to see uh, those returning to our communities as individuals, as, as human beings? Uh, enough to restore their right to vote. It's a, a hard thing to do for people, uh, people in my family having to beg for your, for your rights back, basically. So I'm wondering how you found success talking to those who may initially be against it. Hey, you, gotta, you, you did the crime, and so I don't really care about what happens to you after that. How have you found success? So I want to I want to give this to to Reverend Liskey in part because he's got a parish and he's got community members that um, come to this issue from different places and um, he uh, both has a heart that's full for the returning citizen but also recognizes that we live in a complicated world so I think I'd like for him to start us off. Well, thank you. Um, hopefully, I can do that question justice because I think it is maybe the thing we have to put our finger on to keep the conversation going in a healthy manner w without taking sides. The first thing I encourage people to do is understand that far too often in, at any level of our government, we pass laws out of anger and we do things out of fear. And so the question I ask is, is our criminal justice system a system, system of anger or is it a system of restoration? Because if we start from a position of anger, then yes, it's very easy to delimit the person, right? Hey, you made your bed, now sleep in it. And so I, I encourage people to back up from that. The other thing that ironically is becoming helpful 
is so many people now, one in 10 people in America have an incarcerated immediate mm-hmm. family member. Yep. And so the more we remove the stigma, the more we allow people to say, wow, man, this has come home. This is, so what's it mean for your family? So don't do it out of fear. We need to understand that we need to restore. We also need to understand that all of us have done something in our lifetime, mm-hmm. and the only reason why we weren't behind bars is we didn't get caught. Mm-hmm. I, I sat with a lot of men behind the walls that really I did things when I was young that if it wouldn't have been for that day and age, the mm-hmm. deputy sheriff taking me home to my dad, mm-hmm. and I had a dad to be taken home to, mm-hmm. and I had a situation that frankly had privilege. Mm-hmm. If I would have been bored 30 years later and been a different situation, I would have been convicted. So it's empathy. How do I have empathy? The second thing is a lot in my situation, I grab a hold of the phrase, the sanctity of human life. Uh, Pat Caruso is a former director of corrections in the state of Michigan and is really a legend in corrections around the country. Uh, She stood up one time and she says, as a committed Catholic, I realize that the sanctity of human life doesn't stop at birth. It continues through the age of an entire person. Do we really think that people who have done time don't have value? Could the cure for cancer actually be doing time right now? Could the next great economic understanding of our world actually be doing time? And again, it's now who who are these people? Let's have empathy and then let's see them as individuals of value. We need to bring them home and re-embrace them. Stay away from political parties, stay away from buzzwords and stances, and try and bring it down to the human person. I don't know if that helps, but that's been my practice. And then Representative Hurtas, if you could talk about how you've brought um, your colleagues from both sides of the aisle together on this issue. Well, that's a great question, and uh, I echo uh, what Reverend uh, Liskey had to say as well. Um, But to the question of how do you promote this, how do you advance it, I mean, you have to keep forcing the dialogue about this and you can do that as a legislator uh, in the legislature, you can have town hall meetings. Interestingly, I chose to uh, write an op-ed article in the local newspaper about collateral consequences, about felony convictions and to just give people some of the stats that I shared with you about Minnesota. It's difficult for a lot of people to understand that when they go to a wedding or go to the ball game, if they just look around Statistically, one out of every 24 persons in Minnesota is under direct correctional supervision, and that just shocks them. They, they can't understand that or even believe that the facts are true. Now, the other part is, is uh, you know, I'm going to touch a little bit on, on what is, uh, I believe, one of the, the impediments and that it can become partisan in that uh, opponents of this type of change or legislation uh, will argue that the preponderance of people afflicted with being convicted uh, align themselves or affiliate with one particular political party. As a conservative, I would argue anybody who's been grabbed by the arm of the law probably has a more dismal view of big government <laughs> and probably would tend to, to uh, maybe not be uh, aligned with uh, the stereotype of one party or the other. So I, I think that's an important thing to remember. And regardless of what the number is, uh, and, it, and it should be a bipartisan issue because this is really about equal rights. It's not about which party you affiliate with or what your political preferences are. But no matter what that distribution of, of those who are convicted of the crime uh, and seeking restorative rights, I just think it's, it's so important to, to recognize no matter who you are and what side of the party you're on that you don't throw – those people, if you truly believe that, you don't throw the rest of them under the bus because you think one side has an advantage over the other. So I, I clearly think that, um, you know, in franchising people to vote, uh, if, if they want to exercise that privilege to vote, that tells me that they're interested in learning more about the issues, about being able to uh, vote for getting your streets repaired, as you mentioned, or vote for, for uh, more funding for education or whatever the circumstances are. But um, at least if you're willing to vote, uh, it's frustrating to listen to folks who just want to be on the winning side when they vote and that they get all of their information, uh, they form their opinions in the last two weeks before an election and do it on 15 or 30 second sound bites. 
Uh, I trust that people are smarter than that for the most part, and especially those who've lost their right to vote. I think if they've been punished by the arm of big government, I think they'll look deeply into who the people are that they're voting for. So I, I think continuing the narrative is, is where we need to go. And if I can just add to that, you're absolutely right. Um, just like it is for individuals with criminal records who don't have a job, when we get a job, we're some of your, your best employees, em, employees, because we know what it's like not to have it. It's the same thing with voting rights. And I think people underestimate individuals with criminal records to assume that they will only align with one party, because many of us are issues voters, right? We, we're not looking at the, the this or the that. We're looking at what this individual has voted on in the past. What is their voting record? What have they What have they done in community? And so, for many individuals with criminal records, they're looking at what that that individual person has done outside of the party, right? And so, that's important. How we were able to get the, our message out is um, with a little bit of funding we had. We made signs and we posted those signs uh, that individuals with felonies can vote on every major highway in Baltimore. I mean, I remember Saturday, I was just riding up the highway, putting out signs up. Uh, in Prince George's County, they had a van and they were just driving around with the van, with, with the signs on the vans and yelling out the window, hey, do you wanna go vote? Do you wanna educate yourself about voting? Um, small updates, like he said, getting on public television to let people know. And then for those, you know, for those individuals on the different opposite aisles, for individuals to be able to vote who have a criminal record, it's a win-win for all of us. It's not just a win-win for one side. It's a win-win for all of us because people are more interested in what that individual has done in their Pacific local district in their state and on a federal level um, than the particular party. Like people are really educating themselves at this point in the game. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Please. We'll go there and then there. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm with Senator Brooker's office. Um, and I'm just curious, I guess, kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, you know, once we succeed in passing this amazing bill, um, do you see kind of a next step of bringing the right to vote to people who are still in prison? I know a couple of states do that. Um, whether that, whether this panel sees that as a valid next step, especially when you consider kind of prison gerrymandering across the country that really has skewed how districts are represented in Congress. Does anybody want to answer that? Interesting that you said that. I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you did, um, what Alfred Justice and Life After Release was able to do last election was that we were in the state of Maryland. Uh, not only can you vote when you when your feet hits the soil, but individuals who are currently sitting in jail waiting pretrial have not been convicted of anything. They're also eligible to vote. And even in Maryland, individuals who are incarcerated on misdemeanor offenses are also eligible to vote in the state of Maryland. And so what we did was we partnered with the warden, um, uh, Chabello. I'm sorry if I'm getting his name wrong, but he was a warden out of Philly. And when Alfred Justice came to him and asked him, could we come in and register individuals, he thought he looked at me crazy. I was expecting to get a no, because anytime you, as someone formerly incarcerated, when you go to corrections in Maryland, you get a no, right? And so I was expecting a no. And he said, of course, you guys don't, don't already do this. And so we went in the local jail in Baltimore. And not only were we able to register men and women to vote that were currently sitting on pretrial, had not been convicted of anything, right? We were able to register them to vote. We brought in the absentee ballots with us. And then we also brought in the absentee ballot um, designee form, okay? And so individuals who chose to get their ballots inside, they were able to do that. But individuals who wanted out for justice to you know, take their ballot to the Board of Elections, we did that. And so we registered over 85 people last election in the Baltimore local detention center to vote. We registered them to vote. We came back and did voter education, a very, um, you know, straight education. We, we can't tell you who to vote for. We can't tell you which party, but we're just educating you about what these things are, who these folks are. Um, we, they turned in the absentee ballots. 
we uh, sent in the absentee ballot designee form. We went and picked up their ballots from Board of Elections, brought their ballots back to the local institution. They cast their ballot, and then we took that ballot back to the Board of, of Elections. So it, it's doable. And then Representative Hurtas, you wanted to weigh in. Thank you. And and I think uh, with regard to your, your question, it's important to understand that this law would affect federal elections. And the powers in our Constitution really don't give the federal government the authority to direct how local and state elections would be done. So one thing you learn in legislating is that gaining political support, public support, getting that momentum, uh, you learn that you have to do things incrementally. Incrementalization yeah. uh, is how things eventually change. And you got to drag people along. you got to build the public support for that. And there could be a, a day or time in the future in which, uh, you know, that would be an end goal regardless of your circumstance that you would even be able to vote behind bars. But I think uh, this is the first step. And there is, uh, on the DRA website, there is this nice colored map that's available that tells you uh, how the different uh, disenfranchisement works in the different states, and it is really a patchwork. And I think that the steps that are being put forth right now within the purview of what is uh, permissible uh, constitutionally at the federal level uh, brings that together in one nice bright line that we've talked about, and that is when you're out of prison, you get to vote automatically. Thank you. And I think we had one question over here. Is that right? Well, Please. I think that question was kind of answered. But. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have one more. Oh. Bill, we've got. Can we have how much more space? We got. And then we've got one in the back over there. Hi there, my name is Aisley and I'm with Democracy Fund. Um, I have two questions that are kind of about the same topic and it has to do with the um, implications of this bill, whether it does or does not pass. The first being, if it doesn't pass, um, do you see this like national narrative undermining the efforts that are happening at a local level, state by state? Um, there are a number of states that are working on the same initiative, but kind of deviating away from the very politicized language and trying to just make it a local issue. Um, so there is a little bit of concern that bringing this to the national level if it is unsuccessful, will undermine those efforts in those states. Um, and then the follow-up is, do you see kind of another, what, as what's going on with Florida right now with the conversation about restitution and payment of fines, and do you see that same kind of concern happening at the national level um, when this bill it does or does not pass? Um, this is Mirna. I'll take it. We work in almost all of the states that are pushing this issue on a state level, and I generally think that momentum is momentum. And... Um, uh, Folks understand that the fights are going to be long and hard. Uh, it, you know, we basically lost Florida for the better part of 20 years until we won it. Um, and so I think that the conversation that is um, bubbling up from the states and getting so big and so loud and so pronounced that we're actually having these conversations in the halls of Congress is a real moment. It, it's a real movement moment. It's it's something that says that this is now an idea that is not, that is so powerful and so profound that we as a nation, we as Americans can speak on one voice. So I very much believe that the conversations are mutually uh, reinforcing, especially since a lot of people in the states tend to not care that much what Congress is doing. They've got their own thing to do. Um, and then um, with respect to what is happening in Florida, um, I think uh, progress in human history is going to be met with resistance, and the very transformative thing that happened in Florida um, scared some people that have power and afraid that they're going to lose it, and as such, they are going to um, put the kind of roadblocks um, that they think that they can um, to try and stop it. Uh, I think Florida is a reason why we need the DRA. It's because um, there are a tremendous amount of permutations, the way that that um, that Edgardo talked about, about what a state policy could look like. And if we want to get people out of the confusion about what their law is and being misinformed because some cousin in another state told them about what their own state policy is, we need to have a clearer rule. Um, this is about the right to vote. And I think um, we as Americans can speak in one voice on that. Thank Myrna, you guys. Myrna, Go ahead. can I add to that? I, I, I can't agree with her more. 
I think it is so important in our system that we do this at every level all at once and that all the levels educate the others mm -hmm. and no bill or law passed is going to be perfect but as it works through the system it gets perfected in its application and particularly in the area of criminal justice we operate at multiple levels in multiple jurisdictions um, yes the federal government leads often um, the federal bureau maybe is a little bit m more of a, a, a a R and D arena that the states and the counties then adopt, but I think on the issue of voting, because it happens at a community level, a state level, and a federal level, and this issue, we have to do it all at once in every arena and do it as hard and as fast as we can. But I'm going to come right back to the Imago Dei and human dignity, but but understand we can disagree with each other, and it's in our disagreement that we find revision and 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 the beautification of this whole process, that it's in our diversity of opinion that brings us to the best possible end result. And if we just keep it going and keep pushing the momentum and not choose sides, but choose the side of the human person, we'll get it right. But I, I, I just think we need to do it at every level as hard as we can. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions about uh, the Democracy Restoration Act, please sign in on our sign-in list. Um, thank you again to Senator Cardin and his staff. Um, uh, this is something we're going to keep pushing on, and we hope you're there with us.